Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. All right. My name is Mike Petrilli. I'm the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. That sounds good to say. I like that. Uh, welcome to Fordham. Oh, thank you. Thank you. How nice. Yeah, I've noticed this is a very happy crowd. It partly helps that we started the happy hour uh, before the event started. Also, I noticed a lot of local DC people here, here to take a bow and to claim their trophy as the best charter school sector in the country. As we get. Yes. Very exciting. Plus the best baseball team in the National League. So uh, DC is on a roll. Let's celebrate it uh, while it lasts. OK. Uh, Really excited to be co-hosting this event today with the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. They've been a great partner on this. And as you know, they are out with a very important new report about the health of the charter school sector. Uh, we're here today uh, to hear more about that report and to dig into its findings. Don't worry, while I like the report and think that it is mostly on track, I'm going to push Todd Zebarth, the author of the report, quite a bit on some of the uh, findings and the analysis. But then we're going to spend most of the time trying to unpack the results, trying to understand why is it that the District of Columbia and Louisiana are at the top of the list in terms of having healthy charter school movements? Why is it that some other states like uh, Oregon and Nevada are at the bottom? And, and most importantly, what can those of us in the charter school movement do to help all states become more like DC and Louisiana when it comes to charter schools? Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce our panel. Todd's going to give some opening comments and walk us through some of the report's findings, and then we'll get into that discussion. Sound good? So, Todd Zebarth, he is the Senior Vice President of State Advocacy and Support at the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools. Todd has been involved in charter school policy going uh, pretty much all the way back to the beginning. It's great to have you here, Todd. We're also going to hear from Scott Pearson, the Executive Director of the DC Public Charter School Board who I believe expects to go home with some kind of trophy. Uh, have we thought about that, anybody? <laughs> we have a little more time. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and then Ken Campbell, the president of the Black Alliance for Educational Options, working nationwide to promote school choice uh, in all its varieties, uh, but also has been heavily involved in the school choice and charter school fights in Louisiana. So with that, Todd, tell us what this study found and what it's all about. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to do a couple of things here at the outset to uh, set the stage for the conversation. Uh, but let me start by saying uh, for the last five years or so, the Alliance has done a ranking of state charter school laws against our model law. And uh, in the course of doing that, um, a number of questions have been raised about, well, what's the actual impact of those laws on the ground and what are these laws actually leading to growing charter school sectors, innovative charter school sectors, and those that are actually producing student outcomes. And so a couple of years ago we decided to take a step back and begin working both internally and with the broader field to try to figure out how would one uh, rate charter school movements on these indicators of growth, innovation, and quality. And so uh, today we're releasing a report that is the result of those two years of work, we expect uh, to continue to refine this process moving forward. I'm sure we'll get a bunch of feedback, some of which will be very helpful in, in, in helping us think about how we might improve this going forward. Um, so I want to, at the outset, sort of say, uh, just give some uh, acknowledgments. Uh, I worked with uh, Dr. Luann Beerlein Palmer hand-in-hand uh, -hand on this, so any praise for the report direct to her. Any criticism send my way. Um, I think she, she provided good, a lot of good leadership on this. Internally, uh, Susan Odd, uh, Wintana, Gibru, Anna Nicotera, former uh, Senior Director of Research and Evaluation, uh, and Kathy Wilson, a doctoral student with Luann Palmer, uh, provided a lot of research help. And then, as I mentioned, we uh, worked with the field quite a bit, um, got a lot of input from them over two years. Um, into uh, this into this report. I also want to acknowledge a few other people who have been helping out with the rollout uh, internally. One is Andrew Shantz, who is, uh, did a lot of good work in designing the report and is helping us roll it out on social media. And then uh, Catherine Bathgate, our communications director, who has done a lot of good work in pushing uh, the, for the rollout of the report. Um, and then lastly, Jill Poppy, who worked closely with Fordham on the event today. So thank you to all of them. It's been a real team effort. Um, so what I want to do, 
is uh, just walk you through uh, the methodology and the findings at a high level. I know Mike is going to push on some questions, and I'm sure folks in the audience will have a lot of questions too, so I'm not going to get too detailed. Um, but what we did was we, at the end of the process, settled on 11 indicators that we used as the basis for the analysis um, categorized into growth, innovation, and quality. Most of them fell into the growth bucket. Um, we looked at public school share, public school student share. Uh, we looked at the demographics of students, both by race and ethnicity, and special populations. Uh, we, we wanted to look at uh, the geographic distribution of schools, so our charter is opening up in urban, suburban areas, rural areas, small towns. Uh, we wanted to look at are there communities where charters are having a particularly strong concentration, where there's at least 10% of the public school kids in charters. And then we thought two other components of a healthy charter movement is our schools are actually opening every year. And at the same time, there are schools that are being closed. The other part of the charter bargain, if schools aren't meeting their accountability requirements, the authorizers there are actually closing them. Uh, this indicator has to do with innovation. Um, we looked at a survey that we did a couple years ago and identified these six uh, innovative characteristics and looked at the percentages of schools that were implementing them. And then lastly, um, on the quality piece, we started out with about a list of 12 indicators we wanted to look at for quality. And uh, the sobering but not surprising thing that we found was the, the state of sort of data collection in state agents, education agencies on these indicators was too spotty to actually use in the report. So we settled on using the uh, credo analysis in their, uh, their reading gains and their math gains for two reasons. One is it's a, it provides a cross-state analysis on a common metric. And the second is it looks at student academic growth and it compares students on similar demographic characteristics. Um, so those were the 11 indicators that we used as the basis for the analysis. We created value statements for each one of those so people, we would be transparent, people would know uh, where we're kind of putting a stake in the ground. For example, we in the report say it's preferable for charters to serve a slightly higher percentage of historically underserved students, in this case racial minorities in traditional public schools. On the innovation uh, indicator, we said to ensure that a wide variety of options are available, the higher percentage of innovations we're seeing in charter movements, the better. Uh, we then weighted them from one to four and then rated each state's data from zero to four. And so each state had a total of 116 possible points. At the end of the day, though, we only scored and ranked 26 of the 43 states with charter school laws. Uh, they had to have at least 1% of their uh, public school students in charters, and they had to have participated in the Credo study. Um, so that is a very high-level overview of the methodology. And again, there are a lot of nuances in the report we get into around innovation and quality and closures that we can talk about in the discussion. Uh, as Mike mentioned, uh, the uh, District of Columbia uh, is number one as a result of this analysis, and I think by a pretty healthy margin over the next uh, state, which is Louisiana, which came in at number two with a uh, strong showing still. And then the states at the bottom two were Oregon and Nevada. Um, and I just want to walk through a little bit why D.C. was at the top and why Nevada was at the bottom. Um, D.C. has a very high share of its public schools that are charters. Same with the percentage of public school students that are charter students. Uh, this, the movement here serves a higher percentage of students of color and a higher percentage of free and reduced price lunch students. So uh, predominantly serving those kids who need options the most. Uh, the uh, D.C. Public Charter School Authorizer Board, um, through the work of Scott or Brian Jones or others that preceded them, um, has taken the accountability part of the charter bargain seriously. Um, 18 charters closed over a five-year period, which translated to about a 4% closure rate. Um, about a third of the schools use one of those six innovative characteristics that I mentioned previously. And then last but most importantly, from our perspective, uh, the uh, charter school students here are showing significantly higher academic growth as compared to the traditional public school. 72 days in reading and 101 days in math. And so there is a lot uh, to celebrate in terms of what's happening here in the public charter school movement in the district. Um, and for a lot of reasons, uh, due to the work of a lot of people that we'll get into in the discussion. On the flip side, uh, Nevada has a low uh, percentage of its public schools that are charter schools and a low percentage of its public school students that are charter students. Um, it serves a significantly lower percentage of students of color. 
as well as a significantly lower percentage of free and reduced price lunch students. No communities in Nevada have at least 10% of their public school kids in charter, so there's no place where charters have really uh, um, formed a pretty strong foothold. A relatively small percentage of the movement is using one of the innovative practices. And then lastly, uh, academic growth in charters is significantly lower than it is in traditional public schools in that state. Now, one of the things that we highlight in each of the specific state summaries that we've written are those places where there's been a lot of work over the last few years to try to improve the movement. And I think Nevada is a great case study of this, where these results aren't, uh, the academic results in particular aren't strong, but the state, in, through a couple of legislative sessions, has passed legislation to uh, create a new statewide authorizer, provide some facility support, and strengthen accountability. So there's a recognition that there are challenges in the movement there, and uh, advocates and lawmakers are taking steps to improve things. Um, so I want to close with uh, just talking a little bit about a section of the report that compares our law rankings with these health of the movement rankings. And again, I'll provide just a high-level summary of that, and then uh, there's nuances within that that we can get into in the discussion. So we were encouraged to see that there was uh, some consistency between states that have uh, high-strength laws in our analysis and those that fell into the top level of uh, these health of the movement rankings. And the same can be said with those states that have medium-strength laws tended to be uh, aggregated in the middle of these health of the movement rankings. And then lastly, many of those states that have really weak laws were not even ranked because they have so few kids in charters. The laws there are so bad, nobody wants to open up a charter school. And look at Virginia, uh, look at Wyoming, uh, look at Kansas. I mean, these are places where, again, the laws are so bad, there are no charters opening up. Now, there are exceptions to the rule in each of these categories. Um, there are some states that we rank high that actually are lower on the health of the movement. Um, and Nevada is one of them um, that it was ranked number uh, 13, I think, in this year's law rankings report because of the legislation I mentioned that they had passed, but they're at the bottom here. And I think one of the main reasons for that is it takes a while for a state, after it passes significant legislation, to actually have that impact the behavior of authorizers, have that impact the behavior of schools. And so we're optimistic that in two, three, four years, you'll see much better performance in a place like Nevada that will be more aligned with where the laws rank. On the flip side, there are some states that have low rank laws. Um, New Jersey is probably a good example of that, that, had, that did fairly well in this Health of the Movement report. And that's because they've had more recently some, uh, they're usually states that have just one or two authorizers that are doing a good job of their authorizing. And uh, you're seeing some good independent charter schools open. You're seeing some replication and expansion. So these are relatively small charter sectors um, that are performing really well, particularly for those students who need it the most. So they tend to uh, outperform the weakness of their law. The point we make, though, is the way to solidify that for the long term is actually to improve the law to make sure that that success can be carried on in the future. So let me close uh, just by saying we thought this report was going to be difficult to do, and it proved to, it proved to be very difficult, and primarily around the data collection piece. I mean, I think there are a lot of different opinions in the charter movement on a lot of these different things, and that's one of the great things about this movement is to have those kinds of discussions and debates. Um, but what was frustrating is more the inability to collect data from state education agencies on some really important indicators to evaluate both public charter schools and traditional public schools. So it's really incumbent on policy and foundation leaders to make data collection reporting a priority so we're able to better gauge the health of charter school movements in states and across states. Um, in the years ahead, we are planning to add more data to this report to present a fuller picture about the health of the public charter school movement, particularly around the uh, value of innovation and particularly around the value of quality. We really want to build those out and add more indicators to have a more informed discussion about how those things are working in states. <coughs> Um, and then in the meantime, though, I think we, we do want to celebrate the successes we're seeing in places like D.C., like Louisiana, like Michigan, like New Jersey, a lot of the um, higher performing states. Um, but at the same time, we want to work to, uh, we want to work with our partners in these places to continue to improve things. Because even in a place like D.C. or Louisiana or Michigan that, uh, that do fairly well in this report, there's still significant room for improvement if we hold ourselves to a really high standard, which I think 
a lot of people in the charter school movement do. So let me just stop there and uh, turn it back over to Mike to continue the discussion. All right, great. Thank you, Todd. By the way, if you see me looking at my phone, I am uh, not checking the stock market or anything. I am following the Twitter stream, uh, which has already had lots of uh, great feedback on this report. Uh, by the way, if you're trying to follow along too, it is hashtag charter movement. So join in. Okay, Todd, let me, let me push you on a few things. I mean, first of all, look, on the whole, I think this is very well done. It is consistent with other efforts to rank states looking holistically like uh, something we did a few years ago, actually looked at cities, but found New Orleans and D.C. to be at the top as well. I think there's a general consensus in the charter school movement that D.C. and New Orleans are the shining lights uh, that all of us would love to have our own charter sectors look more like. But, but let's dig in on a couple of things uh, that, that people are questioning. One is this preference for urban charter schools over suburban. Uh, you think about some of the early adopter, of ch adopter states like Colorado, Minnesota, California. There's lots of suburban charters in those places. And the, the people in those states will say, hey, that's been really important. They're, they're an important part of the charter sector. They also help politically, by the way, to have suburban parents uh, as advocates. That changes the political dynamics. So is this report biased against those kinds of suburban charter schools? It is not. No, we, we tried to walk a fine line here between encouraging states to have charters in all types of communities because I think there's a uh, misperception we run into a lot where people think that charter schools are an urban-only phenomenon. And I think, as you mentioned, Mike, uh, that's clearly not the case. And in fact, the national data on this shows 55% of charters are in urban districts, but 45% are in suburban areas, rural areas, and small towns. And so. Um, so the fact of the matter is their charter is thriving in all types of communities. So in this report, we want to both encourage states to have statewide movements, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we do give a slight preference to those places that are serving what we categorize as historically underserved students, those yeah. racial minorities, uh, free and reduced price uh, lunch students, English learners, special education students. Um, those in non-suburban areas. So, so let me keep pushing. I mean, I would argue, though, that it's actually a bigger advantage. Uh, let's take Minnesota, for example. That comes in, what, in kind of the middle of your rankings. Yeah. And here's a state that has a lot of suburban schools that many people would consider very innovative, right? A lot of online learning or blended learning, a lot of project-based learning, the kinds of things that Ted Coldery, one of the godfathers of the charter movement, has, has been very enthusiastic about. But some of those charter schools, their test scores look mediocre when you look at Credo. Because for one thing, they're compared to other suburban traditional public schools who have pretty good test scores. And second, a lot of the parents that are choosing those schools are choosing them because they want something that's an alternative to schools that are focused on high test scores, right? That they want something more progressive, more alternative. And so it's not surprising that those schools may have lower value added. They say, look, we're not into the test scores as much as the other schools. The, the concern here is that, again, you're, you're you know, by, by not taking that into account, we're going to push the movement just towards urban, no excuses, charter schools, right. and, and ignore the rest. Yeah. I think that's a fair critique, and one we debated internally before the report was released and how to handle it, and I don't think we came, obviously we did not come to a good conclusion on it, because there really is, if you are starting a charter school in Douglas County, Colorado, suburban Colorado, uh, high-performing school district, um, and your charter school performs as well as the school district that's a good thing. That's fine because it's a high-performing district. It's just providing a different kind of option. Yep. Um, and this it, versus if you're opening up in Pueblo, Colorado, it isn't good enough to be performing as well as the district because the district yep. is struggling. And so, so I think that's a fair critique and one that I think we have to think about going forward is do you differentiate between charters in high-performing districts versus charters in low-performing yeah. districts. All right. Second question, uh, the use of the Credo data. I, I think the Credo data are great. Everybody knows about this. This is the Credo Center at Hoover that looks at value-added gains for charters. Uh, does a, an impressive job matching charter students to very similar kids in district schools. But some would say, well, look, the reason D.C. and New Orleans do so well in Credo is because the District of Columbia public schools uh, and the public schools in Louisiana uh, are so terrible, right? Uh, that might be why Michigan does pretty well in this rating and pretty well in Credo, is you're comparing it to the Detroit public schools. So, uh, and Mike, so when, when you're in states where the competition is much tougher, uh, you don't look as good. I think Mike's making a pitch for Common Core. I was not! <laughs> Todd! Oh, 
Oh, we were going to get through a whole event without mentioning that. Todd. Huh. I, I should add, Todd, you know, we have a new, from some of you might notice we have a new lectern here. That's because I broke my old, the old lectern practicing for the big Common Core debate a few weeks ago. I got so animated, I threw it over and it cracked. Anyway, so, no, I don't want to talk about Common Core. Ah. All right, go ahead, Todd. Um, I, no, I, again, I think that's a fair critique as well. Um, in, in one of the things we debated this time around and weren't able to pull the data together from st state education agencies was, um, you know, are there metrics that we can create that would compare charters to their districts so you could show that, yes, charters in Detroit are outperforming Detroit public schools, which is a good start, but do, should we also have a metric that compares them to their statewide averages to be able to say, yeah, we're performing better than the district, but we need to be aiming higher. Now, that still doesn't deal with the cross-state issue about how some states have higher standards yeah. and some states have lower standards, which is why all right. I thought you were going to come. Okay, let's, let's get Scott and Ken in here, because Scott's eager to get in here already. Hold on, yeah, we're going to get you in here. So again, Scott, Scott's going, come on, you're already getting the trophy. Don't worry about it. You got it. I'm not taking it away from you. Do Don't we, worry. But when did we get to the place where we were saying where we're saying that schools that do as well as the schools in the district are, are good enough? I well, thought charters right. were supposed to be better. Yeah, that's exactly not right. Not just in urban districts or historically struggling districts, but anywhere they operate. Right. That's but the but the credo data are saying, you know, basically, the, does a charter population do better than a similar district population? So, you know, D.C. looks good on that, but the comparison is to mostly to other, you know, high poverty, high minority kids in the D District of Columbia public schools. That's your comparison group. A much tougher comparison group might be, you know, uh, suburban students in Minnesota. Uh, and so it's not an apples to apples comparison. I don't agree. I think it's as much of a challenge to improve the performance of students in Washington, D.C., as it is to improve the performance of students in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. All right, but the, com but the peers you're being compared to are much lower performing here in D.C. than they are in Minnesota. But that doesn't make it easier to improve right. their performance. Fair enough. Okay. So Scott wants to get in here, as well he should. <laughs> uh, and let's, let's start with this question, Scott. How do we explain D.C.? I mean, we know why it does well on this, uh, on this particular report. It's done well in other reports. But how are we so fortunate in this city to have gotten to the point where we have such a strong charter school sector? So uh, we, we've talked about the fact that the law here is good. We do have a very good charter law. We have high levels of autonomy for schools. We have relatively equal funding, not, not perfect by any means. We have high levels of funding. Um, but I would highlight a, a few other areas. First of all, um, you know, with modesty, I would say the, the authorizer matters. It, the, the report shows this, um, and it matters not only because of a commitment to quality, um, authorizing, being selective in which new schools we authorize, um, being tough about closing low-performing schools, but also an authorizer that has a real commitment to equity, um, making sure that charter schools act as public schools, that they serve all students. Um, and that commitment in D.C. goes to, for example, making sure that the application materials don't have anything that would discourage students from applying. We have a mystery shopper program where we uh, call schools posing as parents of students with special needs to see what kind of a response comes back um, and then report that back to schools and in, in egregious cases, you know, then uh, bring the schools before the board. So uh, an authorizer not only committed to quality but committed to equity. And I, and I think we see the results in that in terms of the, the market shares or the, the percentage shares of students um, low-income students, students with disabilities. Um, another thing that is important is um, the focus of the philanthropic community on Washington, D.C. And we see other communities doing this through the Sea Trust, for example. But that, what that focus has done is it has not only supported charter schools directly, but it has built this ecosystem of support around the schools that when I visit schools, I see is tremendously important. It's not only great <coughs> charter advocacy organizations, but it's college access programs, it's human capital programs, it's, um, it's programs to help schools uh, understand their data, it's, it's programs that uh, help schools with literacy. It, it, there are literally hundreds of these programs in Washington, D.C., um, and, and it's a real help. And then the third, I would say, is just really strong people. Um, and we have great school leaders, and most of them are DC natives or people who were living in DC and working in DC before they started schools. 
Um, and what, what we've seen is, is that when you have a, an open, thriving charter sector, it attracts high talent people who wouldn't normally associate themselves with a traditional public education to come into uh, the sector. And so when, when I look at some of our largest and most successful schools, you know, you know Donald Hemp, the founder of Friendship, was a nonprofit executive. Chantel Wright, the, found, the founder of Achievement Prep, was an attorney. Uh, Emily Lawson uh, was a management consultant. And so we brought these people in our community and turned their talents towards education. So a couple of things to comment on. First of all, the charter law, and I think everybody has agreed for a long time that the law is very strong here. Uh, note, that was Congress's doing. A point to Congress, okay? Back in 1995, it was a long time ago, but they got something right. All right, that's very exciting. Um, the, uh, the talent piece is very interesting. I don't know if you've ever seen Catherine Bradley give her PowerPoint presentation, but at one point they, it shows the Capitol dome, dome and it says a talent magnet, which is probably the only time anybody's ever shown that slide, right? That, uh, but the larger Washington, D.C. community, if not Congress itself, uh, is, is a real magnet for talent, and that matters. So, but let's be cynical here a little bit, Scott. Other people would say, look, it comes down to one thing, money. Right? Charters in D.C., uh, while they don't get as much as D.C. public schools, they get a ton of money, $15,000 per child or so, plus facilities financing. Uh, I mean, is, is this, do you think, something that, that explains why you've been able, particularly to, well, to have high-quality schools and also <coughs> attract some great national networks to, sit, to the city? Uh, the money hasn't hurt, but... Uh... <laughs> Tweet that. There we go, yes. <laughs> But you know, I think if you if you were to correlate the health of the movement uh, scores against the per pupil reimbursement, you wouldn't find a particularly high correlation. Um, and I, I used to work in California with charter schools, and you know the per pupil is half of what it is here, and there are some outstanding charter schools there. So money helps, but it's it's by no means everything. And and what matters a lot more is um, is the environment that the schools are operating in. And we now have reached this place where, you know, we have uh, almost half the students in charter schools. We have 112 charter schools. The competitive intensity is high, and that competitive intensity has, in part, been responsible for the, for getting DC public schools to up their game. So that they're a lot better than they used to be, and they are competing hard for students and and improving their schools. So we have this, you know, this virtuous cycle where. Charters and DCPS are competing hard with each other and, and every year needing to up their game. Good. By the way, if anybody says coopetition, uh, you, you have to drink. That'll be part of the uh, <laughs> drinking game here. All right, Ken. Yeah, uh, but before I talk about Louisiana, yes. I, I do think you know, Scott makes a great point about DC. You know, I was here when the DC charter school law passed, you know, helped to, to make that happen. And, and I do think uh, DC was, was a little unique in that it was one of the few places I saw where community leaders really stepped up to the plate from day one, right? It wasn't, you know, five or six or eight years down the road. I mean, from the very beginning, people like Donald Hintz, businesses, other folks understood the power of this and jumped right in before it was really proven. I mean, this is, you know, mid 1990s. And so I just think the courage uh, and the vision that those folks had was very important. And I think that that certainly has contributed. I agree with that 100%. All right, so let's talk about Louisiana. Place to be. Yeah place to be. So uh, oh, a lot of us have heard the New Orleans story, but, but how, do, how do you explain this, that uh, New Orleans in particular has such a high performing uh, and, of course, huge yeah. charter school sector? Well, you know, I think, I think understanding the story of Louisiana <clears throat> is understanding not just New Orleans, but I think our charter school movement as a whole uh, across the state. You know, prior to uh, Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, Louisiana did not have a lot of charter schools, but the ones they had were incredibly high performing. Uh, many of those were in rural areas, places like uh, of Oils Parish, uh, down in Bell Chase, uh, down uh, in, in Plaquemine Parish, uh, schools that were kind of far out, but where, again, visionary educators and community leaders got together and decided that they needed to change the way kids were being educated uh, in their community. And so post-Katrina, uh, you know, post-Katrina, once we start to go into the charter school movement with a lot more uh, assertiveness, um, I think what happened is there were a lot of lessons that could be applied around, around what it took to, to you know, really evaluate schools, using a third-party application process to try to take some of the politics out of the decisions that were being made. 
they'll take all of it out, but to take a big piece of the politics out, I think, was very important. Uh, whenever we had an opportunity to improve our law or our policies, we always tried to use incentives to encourage stronger performance for our schools. So when we changed our law to allow a charter term of up to 10 years, we also changed policy that said, you know, schools in a certain performance category could get a charter renewal of a certain length of time. You know, schools that were higher performing could get a longer renewal period, which all schools wanted. Schools that were at the bottom level of kind of performance that enabled them to get a renewal could do it, but they could only get so many. So you can only get a certain number of two or three year renewals uh, to your charter, which our law allows. So we really have been trying to ratchet up uh, this whole idea that we need to incent schools uh, to have increasingly strong performance. And I think that has uh, served us really well. Uh, we make, uh, you know, really, you know, I think good and tough decisions, uh, especially when it comes to renewal. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, have closed probably a couple dozen schools uh, in the past six or seven years, and so we've been very serious about that process. Um, and so that has worked as well. We have, you know, really, you know, our local school districts can authorize, but the big authorizer in Louisiana is the state board. And we've been fortunate to have a state board uh, that is supportive uh, of, of charter schools, that understands it, that wants to do it right. And so they really have served us well uh, throughout this process. And then I think the last thing that I'll talk about, which I think is, is, is uh, you know, very similar to the things that Scott talked about, which is kind of the, you know, what's the environment like, right? Do you have an environment that allows schools to be incubated? Do you have the type of environment where everybody who's a part of the movement understands that it really is about student performance uh, first and foremost, and so that the expectations <clears throat> in New Orleans are, are really higher uh, than they are just about anywhere that I've been. You know, people who come or people who want to start charter schools understand from the very beginning that the expectations are going to be high uh, and that if you don't meet the bar, then, you know, bad things are going to happen. And, and we actually don't have, you know, kind of big contentious you know, conversations about, you know, non-renewal or school closure. You know, we go in, we have the conversations we need to have, we prevent, we provide, you know, very clear evidence uh, of what we're uh, seeing. And uh, our schools really have a tradition now of kind of understanding the importance of voluntarily surrendering their charter when they aren't performing as well as they need to. So uh, those things, I think, have, have, have really served us well uh, in Louisiana. All right. Excellent. All right. Let me start pushing on, on a few of these questions. And Todd, welcome to you to get into this conversation. Uh, Ken, you mentioned that you, in Louisiana, you were able to get the politics out uh, of a lot of these discussions. Yeah. Some of the politics <laughs> out. Thank you. Yeah. And you talked about a certain kind of environment that focused yeah. on quality and achievement and performance. Yep. Uh, and But let's talk about that. I yep. mean, you know, a lot of people uh, who don't like charter schools say that it, they are undemocratic. Yep. Uh, that they cut against local control. That is certainly now a, a public issue in New Orleans, yeah. the sense that this faraway State Board of Education is making decisions. That State Board that's mostly white, right? And so here we have a, a city that's mostly black that does not have local control over these schools, right? Uh, you could argue the same thing in D.C. I mean, here you have a, a public charter school board that is not elected. It's appointed uh, with, with input from the mayor, right, and then appointed by the Secretary of Education, the Federal Secretary of Education. Uh, so, uh, you know, you could say in both of these cities they have fairly undemocratic authorizers uh, that are participating. Let's talk about that. Is, is that why they are high quality? And if so, uh, do we just have to accept that, uh, that in this case democracy is, is not working as we'd like it to? Who wants to take that one? It's an easy one. It's easy. <laughs> you know, look. And, I, I, and don't worry, you got people like Rick Hollenberg yeah. right here listening to everyone. Look, I, so. I don't mind starting that. I mean, I, I do think um, in Louisiana, you know, our politics, uh, politics in Louisiana is tough, right? I mean, it's, it's really, really tough. Um, and I can distinctly recall sitting around the table when we were bringing in a number of our districts that had decades of, of failure. You bring in the local school board to talk about failing schools, and a guy is there who's on the school board, you know, who's, you know, 65 years old, and his grandson is there because his grandson runs the local high school that's the failing high school, and everybody has the same last name. And at the end of the day, I think that makes accountability very difficult, and I think it makes decisions, you know, the tough decisions that you have to make uh, very difficult. So I do think there is some advantage in being able to take away, you know, some of the politics that are involved with just the truly kind of local school board democratic process. Because it is about politics. People are working to stay elected. Uh, and it's just very hard uh, when you're in that environment to make the decisions that you need to make all the time. I mean, I really believe that. Scott, you want to weigh in on this? Um, there's no question that the, the independence of the public charter school board has helped us make tough decisions about closure. 
um, over time, uh, the Charter Board has evolved. For example, it used to be that the Secretary of Education would appoint board members, but now it's the mayor and the city council approves them. So we have become more closely tied in with the political system, and so far that has not eroded our sense of independence. But there's another side as well, which is that um, you know the whole city moved away from a lot of participative democracy when they created mayoral, mayoral control about 10 years ago. Um, and that was a recognition, exactly what Ken said, that, that too much politics can get in the way of school quality. But at the same time, you know, we have 112 schools operated by 61 separate local education agencies. <coughs> Each one of those has right. a school board with the majority DC residents on it. The average school board is seven people. So you know, do the math. There's now over 400 people who are directly involved with the oversight of public schools in Washington, DC. And in the past, the elected school board was 13. So, you know, by some measures, we have increased by more than 30-fold mm -hmm. the number of citizens who are involved with overseeing yeah. public schools. Yeah. Tom, I'm just going to echo that because you know charters to me are the ultimate form of local control, if done well, mm -hmm. in terms of empowering a group of people within a community to actually run a school. Um, but I still think at the same time, like you're raising a really good point for us to be cognizant of that. Uh, whether it's a, the D.C. Charter Board or whether it's an independent state agency or a state board of education. Um, I think if these, as we've seen in some other areas, if these efforts aren't done, care, aren't done carefully with the community, even though you're creating better options for kids than what exists and you are empowering people through serving on boards, you're running the risk of real backlash. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter if the schools are better or if you're providing that opportunity through local boards because our opponents are sort of seizing on the undemocratic nature of things, even though, you know, 5% of people vote in local school board elections or something, I mean, something really low. Um, but it's just a real risk, I think, that we have to be aware of. Yeah, and, th and that's a really important point you just made, is that it's not like our most traditional school districts are all that democratic when they hold elections <laughs> on purpose on off-cycle times yeah. and get very low voter turnout. Many of the people who do turn out uh, are either workers in the systems or their families. In, in Wisconsin, we, we elected our state superintendent like on Tuesday from three to four, you can vote or something like right. that. You know, I mean, it's just it's set up to not have normal people participate. Yeah. And that's why you just moved to Michigan. It right? is, yes. yes. <laughs> okay, a okay. uh, couple other things. Authorizers, right? So we have these two cities, let's talk about cities now, New Orleans and DC, that have basically one authorizer. Many of us in the charter school movement, uh, including the Center for Education Reform here today, you know, I've been argued for a long time that we need multiple authorizers. That we, and we certainly would, first of all, say you can't just let the school district be the authorizer, but even beyond that, that we should have a, a dynamic where there's more than one authorizer. I mean, do we need to rethink that? What do you think, Todd? We'll start with you. Uh, so we start from a place that you definitely need at least one option besides a school district. We, we encourage states to allow school districts to be authorizers. And some of them will choose to do it, and you know, some of them will choose will actually do it well. But they tend to be the exceptions to the rule. Uh, but we think there needs to be at least one other alternative. And depending on the size of the state, there could be more than one other one. Uh, but we do think it's important to have options. And the question is, yeah, I think this is coming up in places like Ohio, in Cleveland in particular, and in Michigan and Detroit, um, where you have you know 10 to 12 authorizers in these particular cities. And what's the real policy goal there and is that really necessary and um, you know I think it, it I think it's a good question and, and I'm not sure it really is necessary to have that many in those places um, now the question is though I mean there in both of those instances there are some good authorizers doing good work and so as we think about you know how many is the right amount you don't want to do things that are going to undercut the good work of uh, some authorizers in both of those states but uh, it, it, as we ratchet up the focus on quality, it's obviously easier to do that in a place like D.C. or a place like Louisiana where you're driving the train from a single authorizer primarily versus a place like Detroit, which now has more than 50 percent of their kids in charters, but they have uh, some really great authorizers and some authorizers who aren't doing as good of a job. All right. Uh, I want to get the audience in here, both uh, in the live audience as well as uh, over the Internet. If you're uh, watching from home, send us the tw uh, tweet to at, not at, what am I saying, to uh, hashtag charter movement, and I will follow it here and we'll ask a question. A um, couple more, though. Uh, my sense is that New Orleans and DC are both places where there's not a whole lot of for profit 
charter schools, right? The, the people who don't like charter schools love to talk about privatization, right? And yet in most of, of these high quality sectors, you know, the schools we're talking about are nonprofits, right? These are social sector uh, organizations. But there are some states like Ohio, where we work on the ground, like Michigan, uh, that do have a lot of for-profit schools. And many of those schools are low performing. Uh, particularly some of the e-schools, uh, and yet uh, those operators tend to be incredibly powerful politically, have made it difficult in some cases to bring uh, greater accountability and quality to the sector. So let's talk about that a little bit. Have, you know, is, is the for-profit status uh, an important issue that we should be considering? Uh, as well as the e-school issue. Is that something that you've been blessed to not have to deal with big e-schools like some other states? Well, in, in, in the District of Columbia, the law requires that the charter be held by a nonprofit, but then that nonprofit can in turn contract with a for-profit organization to manage the school. And it has been a low percentage. Um, and on the whole, it has been unsuccessful in D.C. So we have one of our lowest performing schools was managed by Mosaica for years, and the school finally got out of that contract, kicked them out, and had to restructure the school. Um, uh, another, uh, another of our lowest performing schools was managed by Imagine, and we ended up closing that school. Um, we have two schools that were managed by for-profits that are the subject of attorney general uh, uh, lawsuits. So this so, is a strong endorsement for for-profit charter schools here in the District of Columbia. But, but I wouldn't rule it out completely. We, have, we also have, um, you know, basis education is in Washington, D.C. They have a for-profit management company, and, and they've been very successful. So I wouldn't completely rule it out, but... I would say, as an authorizer, we approach for-profits with a higher level of skepticism than non-profits. Ken, does that help in New Orleans to against the privatization argument that you don't have no. big for-profits? No, it doesn't no. help at all. I mean, <laughs> it, you, know, they, you know, opponents of charter schools are going to call them privatized schools regardless of who runs them. And that's just, it, it's unfortunately uh, part of the reality that we have to live in. Uh, but, you know, we, we also don't have a lot of, uh, of for-profits uh, in Louisiana. We have some, but not a whole lot. Um, I always like to make sure, though, that people understand, and, and this is just Ken Campbell's perspective, and it may be wrong, uh, but I don't think we would have a charter school movement in this country without the work that a lot of for-profit companies did, you know, early on, just in terms of expanding the movement, in terms of getting the word out there of what these schools were all about. Uh, and in some respects, I feel like we've given them a little bit of a bad rap because um, you know, because of their model, you know, many of their schools had to open at scale, right? They couldn't come in and just say, we're going to start a kindergarten and we're going to grow one grade each year. And so they were coming into communities starting entire K-5 and K-8 schools, uh, where I think just the bar of being able to show strong performance is that much harder. Uh, so in some respects, I do feel like we've given them a little bit of a bad shake. Uh, but that being said, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, performance is what matters. Uh, in this, and in many cases, they haven't performed as strongly as they needed to. Uh, we, we, you know, work very diligently in Louisiana to remove, um, you know, some for-profits who were not doing a really good job. Uh, but we still have a few that are doing, um, you know, pretty good work. We have uh, Charter USA, we have NHA, uh, we have uh, One K Twelve, One Connections. Um, and so far, you know, seem to be doing fairly well. But again, our accountability uh, system is one that says if you don't perform, mm -hmm. you got to go, and they got to be held to that same standard. That's great. But, so but if, if you I, can, if you've got a system that can focus on quality and accountability, it gets whoever. Yeah. Then, then it works. Okay. But Ken mentioned a, a very typical approach of for profits, which is they open with a lot of grades all at once yes. because of the economic incentive, yep. even though that is often not recommended for yep. opening with quality. Yeah. Todd, you've looked a lot at this question about virtual charter schools, these online-only schools, and uh, it's fair to say that, on the whole, the performance has been pretty terrible. Before I answer that, I just want to uh, jump in on this one, because we've always been and continue to be fairly agnostic about the whole for-profit, non-profit thing. Um, and, and I do think it, it does have a lot to do with authorizing, and I think there needs to be much higher scrutiny among some authorizers at looking at the track record of yeah. some of the operators. It's not that we don't want for-profits to be able to contract with schools to run them. It's just we want authorizers doing a better job scrutinizing. If that operator is running predominantly poor schools, they shouldn't get another charter. Or if they're running predominantly strong schools, they should get a charter. And that's really where I think we're seeing a lot of too many authorizers fall down on the job. Um, on the virtual question, um, I, I do think <coughs> You know, there's been a lot more uh, heat on that one than light over the last probably couple of years. 
um, whether it's the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, a number of newspapers have ran um, have ran pretty lengthy pieces about it, and um, in a number of different state agencies have done some studies of them. Um, and so our concern right now is is the fact that we're seeing um, too low performance among full-time virtual, not blended, but the full-time piece. And with the increasing scrutiny around it, we think there's a real danger that some folks might throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because even in, in instances where the school as a whole may not be performing well, we know that this option works really well for certain kids. Mm -hmm. The problem is right now, are these schools, some of which are 10 to 15,000 students big, are they just serving way more kids than can be successful? In them? Um, I, I, I don't know the answer, but I think there's some potential radical policy uh, changes that need to be made to ensure that this option is still available. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly the case that there are states like Ohio where if you take out the virtual charter schools, the performance of the charter sector looks much better yeah. than and if they are included. Credo did that in Pennsylvania, and they broke out the brick and mortar and the cyber is what they call them there, and it's, it's like night and day. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's get some questions from the audience. Raise your hand, and John or Megan will come around with a microphone. We need to use the microphones because of our online audience. Over here, Nelson Smith who says I make a good devil's advocate. Don't do Nelson that first. Over. Don't do Nelson first. Oh, come on. <laughs> like, Nelson gets to take a bow because he was the head of the D.C. Charter School Board for a long time. He deserves a lot of credit. And the head of the Alliance, absolutely. And the head of the National Alliance. Thank so, you, Mike, Nelson. If you read the two Credo reports, which, which you use here. <clears throat> is that on? Hold on. Let's make sure that is on yeah. and working. Yeah. Is it green? It's red. It is. Yeah. We need it to be green. Now it's green. Oh. <laughs> the man behind the curtain. That's good. Uh, so if you read the two Credo reports, you see that the improvement in the movement nationwide was largely driven by closures of poor performing charter schools. And I, I note that you kind of came up with a metric for what's the right number of closures or how many is good enough, how many more than that is not good. Could you talk a bit about how you came to that conclusion? And I'd be curious in the other panelists' uh, responses about the role closure plays uh, in having a thriving movement. Uh, so as just about every one of these we're going to talk about, uh, this is debatable. I mean, we, we looked at the data over five years in each state in terms of the number of schools that closed and calculated average closure rates and then sort of stacked the states up and tried to make logical cuts around uh, on percentages and landed with the value statement that a uh, state should be closing a steady number of charters, but not too many, because that sort of indicates lax authorizing on the front end. Um, but at the same time in the report, we acknowledge two things. One is some of the newer states that are coming online uh, over the last several years or that are really improving their laws um, and starting their movements from scratch. Um, we actually think we'll probably have relatively low closure rates over the long term, because they're starting out in a stronger place than other states did back in the 90s, just in terms of all the lessons learned. So they're going to be lower than that, than the high score rate that we had before. On the flip side, there's some states that actually got the highest score that we know need to continue to close schools because, you know, the example we always give is in Texas in 1998 where 100 people applied and 100 people got charters. And I think advocates there would say we still have work to do to kind of deal with that cleanup. And there, you know, Texas is a state that's done a lot over the last few years to ratchet up its focus on quality. But so my point is there are some states that actually are closing a fair number of charters, but just had, you know, made some, had, had a more freewheeling approach in the earlier days, and that they're doing a number of things to try to get ahead of it. Okay, question from Twitter from Ashley Jokum. The question is, is there a tension between growth and quality in the charter movement? I'm curious, Todd, there, that we can answer that empirically to some degree. Are there some states, you know, did, are, are these final grades in some cases because a lot of states were high on growth or high on quality and they get merged together? Uh, or do you see these more hand in hand? And I'd be curious, uh, you know, from Scott and, and Ken, how does this play out? Well, I would say there, I don't think you can make a generalization. Here you have D.C., 44 percent of its kids in charter schools and, you know, just a, a really strong performing movement. Um, and then there are other places like New Jersey, which has a really small percent, 3, 4 percent of the state's kids in charters, um, but does fairly well. 
uh, on a number of other indicators, including quality. And then on the flip side, you have some states that have high market share, low quality, high market share, high quality. So I don't think you can make any kind of general. I mean, people could say, look, it's easier if you've got a little a niche market, right? Uh, you're just going to you know, have just a handful of charters, and or there's a very limited cap, then yeah, you can be super selective. It's not that hard to have a high quality sector. It's much harder to, to do that super, at scale. You still have to be super selective, yeah. right? And there are some states that have a low number of charters that, you know, they're just not. Nevada has 25 charters, yeah. right? Gotcha. And I can say, as we think about future growth, there's no tension at all. Our single-minded focus is on quality, and if that produces no new charter schools or if it produces 10 new charter schools a year, that's not the issue. The issue is whether we can have a high-quality sector. And that has actually, I mean, we're at a very high market share percentage, but the rate of market share growth in D.C. has slowed a lot. We've only grown about one percentage point per year. Um, for the last three years. Um, that's partly because we've been aggressive about closing and we've been very tight about um, authorizing new schools. It's also because for the first time in 50 years, the number of students going to public schools in D.C. is finally rising because the quality of the charter schools along with the improvement in DCPS is getting noticed and people are coming back to the city. So it's easy to grow when the pie is growing. You don't have the market share issues. Yeah, I think in New Orleans, um, you know, we've grown all we can. I mean, we're at 100% <coughs> of kids in charter. So, uh, you know, any growth will just add to that 100%. It'll just make the number bigger. Uh, I do think we'll see a lot more growth in uh, in Baton Rouge. But I think I think uh, closure and growth, in my mind, are somewhat connected. Because, see, I believe... To become a good authorizer, you have to go through some pains of, of learning lessons about what kind of works, what doesn't work, right? Going through the process of closing a school and seeing it be difficult and how it works really helps you to get better on the front end, right? And I think, you know, in many cases, if all you have is a bunch of growth without the kind of bad tasting medicine on the back end, right, it, you know, you're always going to be stuck in that place. And so I think for us, we've learned a lot from the closures that we've had to do that actually help us to grow smartly uh, as we go forward. Great. Okay, next question right here. Hi, uh, my name is Rich Long. I'm with Literate Nation. And all of you have talked quite a bit about uh, the uniqueness of your authorizing function. And I'm wondering what the takeaway for the larger system is, because historically, closing, public school closings is very, very difficult for a lot of both political and practical reasons. And so I was wondering, if you were on the school board, what would be your transfer of knowledge? Yeah. You know, for me, I think, <clears throat> so part of it would depend on what, what, what was the reason for closure, right? Because we, you know, in, in D.C., I mean, in, in New Orleans, there were a few schools that we closed and did not reopen. But in many instances, as we closed the school, we actually got a new operator to come in because parents wanted to be in that building, they wanted to be in that space. So we actually designed a process that, that actually envisioned that we would have schools closing. And so we had people begin to work well in advance of, of you know, their ability to take on a new school. So we had applications of people who said, look, if there's a K-8, you know, I'm, I'm ready, I can go, this is how I would do it. If there's a high school, I'd be ready to go and this is how I can do it. And so in some instances, it has allowed us to keep a building open, but to replace them with a new charter authorizer. Uh, and so we've had to do that. But in other places where we've had to close schools, what we've tried to do is just be very thoughtful uh, and very sensitive to that process, right? We've tried to do it at a time when other, you know, not after, you know, like all the recruitment stuff is done for the next school year so that parents are stuck, you know, with nothing out there. We try to do it early enough so that parents can have the full range of options when deciding on a new school if they have to do that. So I think you have to be very sensitive, you know, and thoughtful about where kids are going to go to school. And then the one final thing I think is um, you have to have plans that allow you and people to know you can get past big problems. You know, we had uh, two high schools uh, in Louisiana, two charter high schools, neither one of which uh, had enough enrollment for their whole building. And people, everybody said, oh, it's going to be a disaster. It's two different gangs. It's two different neighborhoods. And everybody's going to hate each other. And if you went to that school the first day it opened, the kids were together, the families were together, and there were no issues at all. 
Uh, so in many cases, I think you have to be very thoughtful and you have to be deep into the community to know those sorts of things to make sure that you have plans for being able to overcome them. So but it has to be done. So your takeaway really is that you assume it's going to happen, you plan for it to happen, so it's, it's not a, yeah. a post facto yeah. cost. So the, you know, what Rich said is, you know, so the takeaway is that you assume it's going to happen, you plan for it to happen, yeah. so you're not surprised by can it. I, uh, can I add sure, Scott. I would say three, three lessons. <clears throat> First, the school board should try to get as much political independence as it can because it's <laughs> making tough decisions. Yep. Um, the second is they should develop a very clear performance framework so that there's transparency and clarity about where oh, the schools anyway. fall. Yep. And then um, they should, to the greatest extent possible, implement a portfolio approach, the kind that SERPI writes about all the time, so that they are making decisions about opening and closing based on the quality of the schools. You know, it's interesting that, that having a lot of good choices in a neighborhood makes it a lot easier to close bad schools, yeah. right? I mean, that seems obvious, but that has been a real challenge both in the charter sector, we see that as an authorizer. When we've had to face some tough decisions, we authorize charter schools in Ohio. It's tough to do it when all the neighborhood schools that you look at, they're even worse, right? And it's been hard for traditional public schools to do that. But once you get to this dynamic where you've got a neighborhood where there are options, they've got spaces, uh, you know, then it, it gives you the, the guts you need. Uh, quick question from the, uh, from the internets, uh, Ashley Inman. Uh, this is, uh, she says, what state didn't do well this year in rankings but has the most promise to move up? Todd, which, uh, which states are you optimistic about? We're going to see them rise in coming year. Look into your crystal ball. Uh, so I, I think it gets to the point I made earlier about some states that have a pretty good legal framework in place because of some reforms they've made over the last few years, um, but that isn't really reflected yet in the achievement data. So I think a place like Nevada has a great potential to move up over the next three to five years because this stuff does take time. And I do think Minnesota, which is kind of in the middle of the pack, um, I think they have a sh strong legal framework in place. And over the last five years, they've had the number of authorizers to our discussion earlier from about 45 to 20 or something. And, you know, they've, they've begun closing some low-performing schools. At the same time, they've reopen the pipeline to new innovative schools and uh, replication expansion. So I would expect to continue to, to see them move up as well. Okay. Uh, let's get a question from Rick Kallenberg over here. We'll come back over here. Hey, hi. And Rick, are you gonna, you're not allowed to plug your book. No, 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 no. I won't mention a smarter charter. <laughs> now you <can>. uh, <laughs> Nicely done. A smarter charter available from Teachers College Press. You can find it now. That's right. Um, so Todd, I have a question for you. The uh, I was intrigued by the idea that you're giving credit for uh, charter schools that had have slightly more uh, black and Latino representation, slightly more free and reduced lunch representation. Uh, as we argue in a smarter charter, uh, there are a lot of great charter schools out there that are consciously uh, integrated by race and socioeconomic status. So I was really encouraged by the fact that you said slightly, uh, as opposed to kind of the traditional charter model, which is to, to brag uh, or boast about the fact that our school is 100% low income, 100% minority. So I'm wondering if you could, could talk about that. And I'll sneak in one other question, just so Mike doesn't think I'm only obsessed with diversity. Um, the, uh, the, the fact that DC and, and New Orleans rank so high um, could be related to the fact that these are, are cities that great teachers want to teach in. Uh, Doug Harris has some interesting preliminary research that suggests that there's a uh, premium on hot cities uh, for great teachers. So I'm wondering if you could talk about how much that plays into the success in those two cities. OK. Let's hear some answers. Well, in DC, um, we have. Uh, we have all kinds of schools. Uh, we have schools that are extremely integrated and represent the full rainbow of the, of the district, uh, both economically and racially. And then we have schools that are um, you know, exclusively low income and exclusively black or students of color. And we, and we have examples of success with both. But one piece of data that has caught our attention is that when we look at the handful of schools that have the very best results in DC, I'm talking about just DC, the very best results with low income students of color. Um, 
achievement gap closing results. They are exclusively schools that serve concentrated pov uh, concentrations of poverty and, and uh, color. They're not our integrated diverse schools. And so that has raised questions among the board of, of um, hmm. whether there's real value in those. I mean, we, 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 su we support and celebrate them all, but, but that piece of data has been important. So, so in the um, in the report, um, Rick mentioned our uh, scoring of states along these three indicators, and we're looking at the the movements as a whole in states. And um, you know, I think there's some folks who would say the bigger the discrepancy between, for example, low-income students and um, in charter schools versus traditional, the better. And, and but from our perspective, you know, we think charters are, and we think they should be serving, uh, should be options for all kids in states, and they can be good options for all kids in states. And so we don't want to encourage, um, you know, charters to only serve uh, one type of student. Uh, but but at the same time, we do want to kind of push charters to have a a preference to, you know, if, if I can only open up six schools in Mississippi, you know, I want most of those schools to be serving low-income students of color, whether they do it in a diverse setting or in a not diverse setting. And then the other thing I just want to mention is we did a report a few years ago um, that uh, looked at this issue and really we highlighted Denver and D.C. and San Diego as places where um, where you have good, you have high-performing charters. I'll just use my former hometown, Denver, as an example. Um, you know, you have this Denver School of Science and Technology, which is a core part of its mission is it wants to look like the city in terms of, you know, be integrated. And, you know, that's just a core part of the mission, right? And then the flip side, you have a school formerly known as West Denver Prep, whose core mission was to serve Latino kids. Yeah. And they're both outstanding models, right? And it's just sort of like, what is the mission that people are rallying around at the school? And if it's diversity, great. And if it's, we just want to serve kids in this neighborhood, that's great too. Yeah. I want to talk real quick, the, 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 as far as the talent question is concerned, uh, you know, I think it's an interesting talent, um, or interesting question. Uh, I don't believe that you have um, uh, huge numbers of, of teachers who are coming to New Orleans. Uh, you have a lot of people who want to get out and start schools and be involved in the reform movement. But, you know, we have, you know, I think a good healthy mix of some, some new teachers as well as some veteran educators uh, who are there and, and doing this work. And, and I think uh, it would be a mistake for us to believe that the only way to do this is to bring in a bunch of new talent, right? So when you go to our schools, you'll see a wide diversity of just kind of ages and races in terms of people uh, who are teaching in our schools. But one thing I think that we have done that's unique uh, in, in Louisiana is we have completely outsourced the kind of talent development role, right? We don't have like a central you know, school district that gets all the teachers and trains them and works with the schools of education. Uh, you know, we have nonprofit organizations like Leading Educators and others that have taken on the lion's share of their work, and they can work with any school. Uh, and so I think a big part of it is, have we had a shift in terms of what we believe teachers need to know and be able to do? Um, and I think that's absolutely true, but I don't think that came just by getting new people, mm -hmm. right? I think it just has been a part of the shift in thinking about you know teachers and what they have to do in schools. But it's interesting that you you I thought you were about to say you leave the teaching recruitment to the schools, but that's not the case. I mean well, that you have all these great we nonprofits do. in New Orleans that take on a part of this mission, yeah. and one of them is leading educators. I mean you've got yeah. this people yes. like to talk. This could be a drinking game word. <laughs> this ecosystem, right, <laughs> of reform in New Orleans, but it's important. It and, is. and every it is. city could benefit from having these kinds yeah. of groups do this kind of work. And it's, and it's a part, I think, of our belief that, you know, of, of this whole idea of rethinking, you know, public education, which our friends at SERPI, you know, really do. We've really tried to do that, you know, yeah. in New Orleans, right? So we don't have the kind of centralized structures, and it's not gloom and doom. You know, it actually works very well. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully people will, will look at some of that. All right, we're going to take our last question right here in the front row. Tell us who you are, too. I should have people do that. Yes, you want to be green. Green is good. That's it. Is yep, it good? Yep. Am I on? Okay. Um, so I just have a question about the methodology. I'm Janet Farrell from M&T Bank. I head our education and not-for-profit lending group. We work with charters across a number of states. And I notice if you look at the listing of states in this 
region, Maryland is not included. Was that lack of the credo data, or was that the percentage of students? Um, and you know, did you look at those states at all, but just not include them in the report? Uh, so we, so for all of the 43, 42 states in D.C. that have charter school laws, we have data in there about them. So if you were to go to the full report and go to Maryland, you would see all of the data for nine of the 11 indicators. You wouldn't see it for the two credo indicators because they didn't participate, and that's why they weren't actually scored or ranked. But all the data around how many schools, students, who they're serving, all the openings, closures, all that stuff's in there for me. All right, I'm going to take the moderator's uh, uh, prerogative. Uh, thank you, prerogative. Thank you. I, I, this is the problem of having a beer up here at the podium. <laughs> uh, I lose words like that. Um, I want to ask each of you, just in closing, what advice you would give to folks in other states about how they can improve their, their charter school sector over the next year or two? What are the few things they should really, really be focused on? Todd, we'll start with you. Well, I would start with the law and, and see if that needs to be strengthened at all. And it might be you have enough in the law already and a good foundation to work from. And then, you know, the next line, I think, is really around authorizing and new school development. I mean, those are some of the key pieces once you have a strong law in place or a good enough law to really make sure authorizers are doing a good job and make sure there's a pipeline of people wanting to start new schools. Okay. Scott? Uh, I'd start with authorizing, and I would look to NAXA, the National Association of Charter School Authorizers. They have a major campaign underway called One Million Lives that's working to strengthen authorizing around the country, including promoting more independent authorizers. Okay. And Ken? So my three would be, um, you know, I think, first of all, uh, I, I would agree with them on the whole authorizing. You know, I like to say you got to authorize, you have to have you have to authorize with courage and excellence. Yep. Uh, and people sometimes miss both or one or the other, but I think you got to have courage and excellence. Uh, the second one uh, for me is I think you have to have uh, incentives uh, because incentives works better than sanctions in terms of encouraging strong performance. And so if you don't have incentives, I just think it's very hard. And then the third one, which is the big drinking game one uh, mm -hmm. that we didn't get to talk about in Louisiana, but it's this whole idea of cooperation. And the reason I'm going to say that one is, and, and, and real quick, uh, we also have a scholarship program, a voucher program that allows low-income kids to get money to go to private schools uh, in New Orleans. But the way that program is, set, in fact, the state of Louisiana, but the way that program is set up, kids who are already in school can only go if they're in a C, D, or F school. So if you're an A or a B school, right, kids can't leave your school to go to a voucher school. So at the end of the day, if you really want this strong performance and keep your enrollment, again, there's another incentive, right, that says you get over this bar and kids can stay with you and they can't leave. But if you don't, they're free to go. Um, and, you know, parent choice is important. So it works. Please join me in thanking our excellent panel for this fantastic event. I, I hope this has inspired you to dig in uh, to the charter school, uh, to, to the report itself, to learn more about the health of the charter school movement, which is available at the National Alliance for Public Charter Schools uh, website. I hope those of you here in person will join us for a reception upstairs on our rooftop. Uh, beautiful night for that, so please stick around. Uh, and please come back again to Fordham. Uh, we'll be sending you some notices about some other great events coming up in November and December. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job.